Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my definitive review of the Sony FE 50mm f1.2 G Master lens. Now, I have been looking forward to reviewing this lens for months since I tended a Sony presser on it, and of course, many of you have requested that I do this review, but it has taken a while for me to get a loaner in my hands due to it just really not being that much in stock, and so I do want to thank Sony USA for sending me a loaner copy and so that I can bring you this review here today. This is the definitive review, so if you want a quicker overview, you can check out my standard review instead. I also want to uh, just bring your attention to the fact that Craig and I have launched a new channel, Let the Light In TV, and uh, here is the quick trailer for it. So be sure to check that out. There is a link in the description so you can go and uh, become a part of that. There will be extra content available there that's not available on my main channel due to space. And so check in, let, check out Let the Light In TV. Now, Sony's G Master series, in many ways, just keeps getting better. And some of the early G Master lenses, I found them to be good lenses, but not exceptional. But that has really changed over the course of the last couple of years with lenses like the 24 millimeter f1.4, the 35 millimeter f1.4, 135 millimeter f1.8, 14 millimeter f1.8, and now this 50 millimeter f1.2. All of these lenses are essentially pretty much the best of their kind. And you would be hard pressed to find an overall better lens than what these new G Master lenses represent. And one thing that I do appreciate is that Sony is managing with each of these lenses that while they're not small, they are certainly these typically the smallest in their class. And so Sony is at least showing some consideration, even though yes, it, this is a big lens that I'm holding here. But compared to the competition from Canon and Nikon, it's not overly huge. And so I appreciate that Sony has been putting some effort into that. And so today we're gonna to dive deep into this lens and give you all the details about it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that sets you free from the bulky traditional wallet while also making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. Visit phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. You can even customize your wallet with new accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even the Chipolo tracking integration if you're the kind of person who loses their wallet. Use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So let's start by taking a look at the build, handling, and features here and give you a closer look at this professional grade lens. So my first impression of the G Master was that it was a bigger lens than what the planar was. That's not really entirely true. And so first of all, I'll show you them with the lens hoods for a moment. There is a difference in design in the lens hood. We have a pedal shape, a little bit deeper, a hood on the planar, and the GMs is, it's just a flat, but it also has a rubberized rim here. It's actually a little bit nicer, a hood in terms of the details, and it does have a locking mechanism. If you just stand the lenses side by side, you can see that the GM is ever so slightly wider in diameter. It is 87 millimeters in diameter, and that compares to 83 and a half millimeters. Other than that, however, their overall length is identical, 108 millimeters. And surprisingly, the G Master actually weighs a couple of grams less at 778 versus 780 grams. And so it's actually impressive that they've managed to go to an f1.2 lens with a few more features while not actually growing the size of the lens. And if you compare it to, uh, say, the RF 50 millimeter f1.2 from Canon, you'll see that it's the same length, but it's uh, definitely narrower in diameter and the Canon lens uh, weighs 950 grams. There's a new Nikkor uh, 50 millimeter f1.2. It is the longest of them at 150 millimeters versus 108 millimeters, and it weighs in at a whopping nearly 1100 grams. So relative to the competition, uh, Sony's actually done a really good job here. Now, GM lenses are feature rich. I find them to be more functional than beautiful. I would say that the planar lens is actually a more physically attractive lens uh, with its you know, ribbed 
um, metal focus ring which moves along really nicely. I actually favor the focus ring relative to the GM. The GM doesn't really have a lot of resistance on it and so I find that the damping is a little bit on the light side for my taste. But the GM lenses do have more advanced weather sealing. In this case I count 10 different seal points according to this diagram and so it's got a thorough weather sealing. Uh, Sony did call the plane our weather sealed, but we never saw a diagram. So I know that there's a gasket here. I'm presuming there is some internal seals, but we, I've never been able to find a diagram that shows where they are. And so the GM also has flooring coating on the front element. And so it's, you know, very nicely weather sealed. It does have the GM approach to aperture in that you have an option of selecting it in one third stop clicks um, all the way through or you can choose automatic and you can control it from within the camera and you also have an option of declicking that aperture and so that you can smoothly glide through the aperture choices. I will note that the clicks are a little bit on the firm side on this relative to some other GM lenses and so I found it to be not maybe the, my favorite um, aperture ring thus far. You do see the focus hold button and in this case you've got it in a couple of positions and so it's accessible whether you're shooting in horizontal or vertical positions. You've got the AF MF switch and so a pretty standard fare for GM lenses. Inside we have got 11 rounded aperture blades and uh, we'll take a little bit look at how that plays out in our image quality section. I will note that as with other GM lenses, we have a very nice padded zippered case that is highly functional that comes along with the purchase of the lens. Our minimum focus distance is a little bit closer here at 40 centimeters, giving us a nice 0.17 times magnification, which is good for a 50 millimeter lens, not as good as the Canon RF 50 millimeter f1.2, which is a 0.19 times magnification, but better than the planar that has a 0.15, which is pretty standard for a 50 millimeter lens. And so a little bit of improvement in that metric. And of course, where we don't have an improvement is in the price, where this comes in around $2,000 versus $1,500 for the planar lens. So as you can see, just a lot of really good things there about the build and the design as per usual, and very, relatively few complaints that I have on that front. And of course, as mentioned, I will follow this up with a subsequent episode where I will do a direct comparison with the planar, so I'm not going to dive too deep into all of those comparisons as a part of this review here today. So let's talk about autofocus. The light is fading fast on me as it tends to do this time of year, but I'm filming right now at f1.2 to help to get as much light in there as possible. So it gives you also a little bit of sense of how it does in terms of staying consistently focused on my face and a little bit of a sense of the video quality. Sony has really kind of mastered the process with these G Master lenses in that they do a, a very detailed calculation of how much torque is required and then essentially they assign as many of the, their XD uh, which are linear motors, kind of high-end linear motors, needed to drive autofocus. Now, the typical configurations I've seen is that in some situations, one, more typically dual linear motors, and then in some situations, quad linear motors. And that's what we've got here, like the 135mm f1.8. F1.2 um, lenses have just huge elements, obviously, a lot of glass there, so it takes a lot of torque to move those. And in times past, what we have often seen is that you really get diminished autofocus. And so you basically have this trade-off where you've got this beautiful glass that you know can produce beautiful images, but the trade-off is that autofocus is slow and it's noisy, all of those things. Sony has thrown all of that out the window here and with these quad uh, linear motors what we have is snappy, quiet, smooth autofocus. It really is next level performance and I found that to tr be true whether shooting video or stills. Craig and I use the lens in a number of situations, some like these where a shooting kind of a static type shot and then other situations we had it for example on a slider to uh, try to get footage of other lenses and also in testing a new slider from uh, Moza that's come out and uh, over that process I found that it did really good a uh, nice stable autofocus performance even at you know close focus distances the one challenge would be is that if I got a little bit too close or Craig got a little bit too close in that where you're you're kind of flirting with the end of the minimum focus distance obviously you get a little bit of pulsing in that situation but overall autofocus was nice and stable 
I got good results as you can see here when I did my focus pull test and I'm not going to bore you trying to listen to anything because there's really nothing to hear in terms of sound but you can see that focus pulls are precise and they're smooth in operation. Likewise if I approach the camera and to see how it uh, did tracking my face even at f1.2 you can see that um, it does a good job of focusing on my eye. And so for video very good performance. Likewise for stills I saw just really Really good precision as you can see in this shot um, that it's you know singled out the right target and there's very crisp detail also in this situation where I was shooting kind of a, across a river through some trees uh, to this fallen tree that's out kind of on a sandbank you can see that I was able to get precise focus at f1.2 beyond that in portrait sessions, I got really beautiful results. And of course, these days, IEF is just so fantastic for shooting portraits, allows you to really compose how you want. And so even shooting at f1.2 again and again, I got very consistently focused results. My only miss was in this shot where I kind of hid my model behind the, uh, this birch tree and uh, it got thrown off a little bit. I don't know if it was the white of the birch that threw it, but anyway, it focused more on the bark than it did on the eye. But that was my only miss and, and probably an understandable one. Likewise, low light performance with an f1.2 lens is excellent. And you're, you know, got that advantage of having all of that aperture of letting in the light to it. And so in this situation, it was a near dark room and Loki was perched on the back of a couch. So I just thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll see how it plays out. And I got consistently well-focused results and it just nailed in great detail. And so obviously that's a plus for a lens like this as well. So at the end of the day, what we have got with these quad X, XD linear focus motors is this just, it's, again, it's next level autofocus performance in that you, you really can have your cake and eat it too. You can have the beautiful glass, huge maximum aperture, but you can also get autofocus that's really as good as what you would see on, you know, the lenses that have f1.8 apertures, which traditionally have given you the better autofocus. Now we get to have both. It's kind of a nice place to be. So obviously the 50 millimeter f1.2 G Master really is an exceptional lens in its autofocus performance, uh, particularly for being such a large aperture lens. And I think the same exceptionalness applies to the image quality. Let's dive in and let's break that down. So first of all, we'll take a look at our vignette and distortion. There is a bit of pincushion distortion here, which is for a portrait type lens is always the preferred style for the simple reason that, as you can see, it kind of pinches in. So it's slimming as opposed to the bulging out of barrel distortion, which has the opposite effect. Most people don't like that. And so in this case, you may actually want to not correct for the distortion in some portrait situations because you may like the effect. Same could be uh, said of the vignette as well, which we'll get to in just a second. Now, when I manually corrected for the um, distortion with a minus five, I got a little bit of a, uh, you know, just kind of a complex pattern there. So a little bit of a mustache pattern that that kind of remains. And, and so it's not a huge deal in the sense that I only manually corrected it, you know, to kind of dis determine how much correction is needed. But most of the time you're going to be using this, you know, standard correction profile, either in camera or in your, you know, software software editing uh, your editing software I should say of choice and truth of the matter is, is it corrects things quite well now for the vignette there is a significant amount uh, probably about three stops or close to it in the corners I used a plus 71 to correct move the midpoint all the way over and so as you can see it let give it it gave it a nice clean end result so for this image I have basically an extreme torture test for uh, longitudinal chromatic aberrations with bright lights and then shiny parts and you can see there is a little bit of purple fringing in some of these very high contrast areas you can also see a little bit of transition towards a, a little bit of green fringing beyond the plane of focus but again this is an extreme situation now a slightly less extreme example is when we look at this milkweed and I've seen many times that because it's a very bright and then you have some transition towards defocus you tend to see some fringing along the edges of it we can see however that even at a pixel level it's really done a good job of handling those uh, aberrations so not really a huge deal in my real, real world shooting likewise I didn't see a lot of evidence of any kind of lateral climatic aberrations you can see that these transitions along the edge of the frame are pretty clean and a little evidence of fringing there 
So obviously our expectations for performance are very high. This is a G Master lens and it's an expensive lens. And so we've come to expect very high performance. And that's what we're going to find here. And so this is at 200% on a 50 megapixel Sony Alpha 1. And so you can see even at this very high magnification level that our resolution and contrast is fantastic. You can see the moir pattern that is there in all the fine detail. The text is very finely delineated, very, very very strong performance even at f1.2. Likewise, as we take a look here at this bill, you can see again, same factors here, very sharp delineation of the text, good textures and details, good contrast. Uh, jumping in here, which I just like to look at this for the overall contrast, it looks really, really good. And if we go right down into the a corner, you can see that that resolution moves out towards the very extreme corner, just a slight bit of softening there towards the very uh, extreme corner, but overall, that's a massive amount of detail. Detail. Now I'll give you a deep dive in a subsequent episode comparing the 50 millimeter f1.4 uh, planar to the GM here. But just for a quick comparison purpose here, we can see in the center of the frame that basically the resolution is very similar between the two, but the GM of course is at f1.2 as opposed to um, f1.4. And so you get basically two thirds of additional light. And so the, and that's shown in the shutter speed here. We can see, I I think just a little bit more of the moir pattern there so maybe slightly more contrast but truth be told at 200 percent if you're not seeing much of a difference here on your screen it tells you that both lenses are incredibly sharp likewise at the mid frame it's hard for me to call a winner there they both look very very strong and down into the corner i think that again i think there's maybe a slight bit more detail for the g master lens but it's not exceptionally different and if you look at an area like here i mean there's some little nuance and difference but they're quite similar overall so my primary takeaway is not that the g master is necessarily tremendously sharper but it is at the very least as sharp at f1.2 as the other lens is at f1.4 and i think that there is a very minor edge there for the gm so that massive amount of resolution means that you can actually get a credible uh, landscape image here even at f1.2 and if we look at the plane of focus we can see it just it's incredibly sharp highly detailed image which tells you that this is no paper tiger it's not just optimized for test chart distances but even here out in the real world it's really performing in fact so much so that if i put side by side an f1.2 and an f5.6 uh, shot in the same context we can see that on the plane of focus it looks every bit as sharp at f1.2 the primary difference is here is that while things go out of focus at f1.2 at f5.6 they're in focus so i mean that still makes this the much more practical focal length for shooting landscapes but it's pretty impressive how well this lens holds up even at f1.2 Here's another real world F1.2 example. And again, completely credible. You can see great resolution and detail, all of these rivets along here. And obviously you're gonna have a minor impact of depth of field, but we can see that there is sharpness right out to the edge of the frame. It was raining uh, very hard while I took this image. So you get all the little frozen water droplets in the air, but you can see that it's an impressive result for wide open F1.2. I also wanted to share this uh, because of that high resolution and contrast and then also that good control of longitudinal chromatic aberrations. You can see that it's handled this type of image really exceptionally well and that I typically see this kind of detail more in a macro type setting. But here we can see that fine delineation of, you know, just really great detail and contrast, even in these, you know, kind of blown out hot spots. We can also see that there is basically no fringing before or after the plane of focus, which allows you to have a really lovely looking image. So just because the lens is exceptionally sharp at f1.2, it doesn't mean that there isn't room for improvement as you stop down. So what we can see here is that it's, it's great at f1.2, but it's better still at f2 uh, with even higher contrast and resolution. And you can see that more noticeably here at the mid frame where you can just see improved detail and contrast. Uh, taking a look here once again, you can just definitely see more contrast that is showing and down in the corner, Oops, get back in there. Down in the corner, we can see contrast is up and that detail, just everything is just that much crisper looking here. The acuity is way up. 
So we'll check in just one more time with the planar at F2 because it does give us a little bit more of an apples to apples comparison. And what I find is that both lenses really look exceptionally good here at F2. And it's hard for me to call a winner between the two. There's a slightly different nuance to their rendering, but both of them are very good. But the planar is definitely every bit as good, I would say, at F2. And you know that's true even down here at the edge of the frame. Maybe slightly more contrast and acuity on the GM lens, but I mean, they both look really, really fantastic. You would be very happy with the performance optically of either lens. So stopping the GM down to f2.8 shows just a little bit more contrast uh, that is shown even between f2 and f2.8. You can see the moire pattern here has become very pronounced, and that's just due to having such incredibly high contrast and detail. It's there at the mid-frame and right down into the corner. It looks fantastic. We'll pop up and look at the other corner, and you can see that it also looks just brilliantly good up here. Very good centering all around. Just a very strong performance. Now between f2.8 and f4, there is only the mildest amount of improvement, not enough to really, um, you know, be noticeable, I think, in a real world situation. And so somewhere around f4, I would say you're getting your peak of sharpness and detail. And, and then after that, it's really about depth of field. And it's not until you start to get on the other side of f11 that you start to lose sharpness. Case in point here, going from F4 to F11, you can see that diffraction has started to take a little bit of that hardcore detail away. And if we move on to F16, which is minimum aperture, you can just see that diffraction is starting to cost us in terms of resolution and detail. Though, let's not kid ourselves, this is still actually quite a strong performance. So as noted, our maximum magnification is 0.17 times, which is not off the charts. It's slightly better than average uh, for a 50 millimeter lens, but uh, above average definitely is the performance up close, which has really, really strong detail rendering. And we saw it on the water droplets that it delivers a macro-like performance in terms of rendering these fine details. And it also seems to provide a su surprisingly flat plane of focus. And so this is going to allow you to get really, really impressive results up close. So here's that minimum focus distance out in the real world. And so you can see on, even on this tiny leaf, lots and lots of detail, but you can see the, you know, the potential for having really creamy defocused backgrounds. In fact, here's a look at how much defocus I can get because of being able to focus up close. And so you can really create a very creamy background if you're shooting up close. This image really highlighted to me how strong the lens was in rendering those fine details at very narrow depths of field and then transitioning to what is a very complicated out of focus background and yet it still handled quite well. Here is a, a portrait of my 135 millimeter f1.8. Now there's a lot of glass, G Master lens, but you can see again, very impressive detail along the rim of the lens, but then you can just see how shallow that depth of field is and then how much you transition to a very creamy background. An impressive looking result. Here's another shot and uh, with varying you know, degrees of depth of field here. And so you can see it's that great combination of beautiful sharpness and contrast on the subject and then a nice soft background. Here's a quick look at the geometry of the bokeh and so f1.2. You can see that there is a little bit of deformation towards the edge of the frame. Not too bad, however. And by f2, you're going to get completely circular bokeh highlights all across the frame. So that's going to be a useful uh, lens for shooting when you have bright lights like this. And we can see as we stop the lens on down that while you can slightly see the 11 aperture blades, it's still a very, very circular shape. So another plus for the lens there. I also felt like color rendition was very strong and so here we've got some beautifully deeply saturated reds here in the sumac. The detail there of course is stunningly good and then the other colors are very complementary. Here the colors are a little less dramatic but you can see that they're deeply saturated but in a natural looking way and so the end result to me is a, a very good looking image. 
Now, all of these elements combine to be a very strong portrait lens. Now, in this case, I have added a preset that, you know, kind of raises some of the black levels just a little bit while adding some contrast. But to me, the end result is stunning, even at f1.2. Great detail, uh, great contrast, but then also nice looking bokeh. Uh, here within monochrome, you can see how intense that is at f1.2 and the shallow depth of field just really, really works. Here, uh, no processing, just out of camera. And so you can see it's backlit, but I've used some front lighting to uh, fill in. But you can see that the uh, skin tones are really nicely handled. There's good contrast. Again, F1.2 here. It's incredibly sharp all around the eyes, well-focused, and the colors look great. And look how soft and creamy that background looks. This is going to be a lot of portrait photographers' favorite lens. Now, again, just briefly, because I will do an episode where I dive into all this a little bit more intensely, but if we compare the uh, GM lens with the planar lens, a few things stand out. I mean, first of all, I mean, both, both of them look nice and sharp, but uh, when I had my wife take a quick look at the images and several others, she instinctively chose the GM. And one of the things that she pointed out is that the kind of the tonality on the skin transitions was just a little bit better with the GM lens which I would agree with. I also noted that the contrast in the hair looked better. And then if you look towards the defocused area, you can see that the bokeh quality here on the GM lens is just a little bit softer and you get a little bit less hard edges as you look at the defocused area. That's the advantage of that f1.2 aperture. And also, I believe, just a little bit softer bokeh rendering. Now, one final thing that I'll point out is that the flare resistance is really strong. Now, in this case, it's hard to shoot at the sun with an f1.2 aperture. You can see that my Alpha 1 gave me a 1 20,000th of a second. And so um, you're, you're really pushing the envelope there. But we can see that either wide open or stop down that there is just very little flare artifacts. Really impressive for such a large aperture lens. And in fact, even if I pan here across at f F1.2. Again, it's kind of blown out because of the video limitations, but you can see that there is really no flare problem. And if we look at it stop down at F11, you can see that contrast holds up beautifully. And there's just basically next to no ghosting artifacts as we pan across the sun. Overall, a very impressive optical performance. So there's a lot of really good things going on there on the image quality front. And I will say that in its kind of main purpose as a portrait, portrait lens, I think the 50 millimeter F1.2 G Master really shines on that front. Just the general usability, but also the overall image quality. And uh, I found while doing a, a portrait session that it was just intuitively easy to use the great IAF, the ability to get you know striking results even at F1.2. Uh, made this a real joy to use out in the field. And certainly the kind of results that I was able to get were just really, really beautiful. And uh, a 50 millimeter lens in times past, I like it, but I don't love it. A lot of times I prefer an 85 millimeter lens for shooting portraits with, or if I want to go a little bit more dramatic, 135 millimeter lens. But the G Master is a lens that just might win me over because it does allow me to get such nice soft bokeh from it while also having such really sharp results. And it's a flexible focal length uh, for even when I want to do a full body type portrait and so certainly a lot of things to recommend it as a portrait lens at the end of the day i think the, the biggest barrier for many photographers is going to be the price this is a very expensive lens at about two thousand dollars though again i will note it's a little bit cheaper than either the canon or the nikon lenses that have been released that are similar you know pro grade 50 millimeter f 1.2 but at the same time two thousand dollars is still a lot of money and so for a lot of photographers, they're going to feel a little bit left out uh, when it comes to this. And so it may be that the planar lens becomes an attractive alternative, and we'll see whether or not the release of the G Master drives the price down as it did with the 35 millimeter uh, f1.4 that came you know, previous to the G Master lens. 
If you can afford it, however, I'm not really aware of a better 50mm f1.2 lens. I think that having tested the Canon RF 50mm lens, it is an exceptional lens as well, one that I really, really loved. But I'm not sure that it's better overall than what this lens is, certainly not in the autofocus uh, department. And even optically, I think that the G Master is right near the top of the heap. And so it is a lens that if you've got the money, is something that could be adding to your arsenal could really set your work apart. And I think that that's really what the G Master Lens or series is all about, is giving a clearly defined top of the heap choice for those that want to spend a little bit more money to get a little bit more exceptional results. And so I do think that the Sony FE 50mm f1.2 G Master is truly a G Master lens in performance in every way. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full text review. There's also an image gallery with a lot of beautiful photos that I recommend that you check out. Beyond that, there are buying links if you'd like to purchase one for yourself. Uh, you can follow either Craig or myself on social media. You can sign up for my newsletter or become a patron. And of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.